On August 29th, Practical Farmers of Iowa hosted a field day at the farm of Chris and Janine Teachout. About 100 people made the trip down to Shenandoah to hear from the Teachouts and from Jill Clapperton, a world-renowned soil scientist from Canada. After hearing from NRCS soil scientist Doug Peterson, the crowd made their way to one of two soil pits to hear about an interesting soil test that many no-till and cover crop farmers have been conducting lately. Yeah, we're going to start out here at the soil pit. We're going to start out with a little fun. You know, here, it's called Soil Your Undies. So, yeah, it gets a chuckle. But anyway, what it is, it's something everybody can do on your farms or sneak over to the neighbor's farm, bury a pair. And basically what this is, it's a little simple test that we can do to kind of measure microbial activity in your soil. And then also if you're comparing systems, you know, if you have cover crops or no-till or tilled ground, comparing those systems and see what the microbial activity is. This is on this farm here. That's after uh, 65 days in the ground. So we've got a lot of decomposition there. And while we're using this, it's a cotton underwear. And the cotton is a carbon source. And so the microbes are eating that. That's part of their food. At the first pit, Dr. Clapperton touted the benefits of diversity, no-till, and cover crops in general, and specifically how a mat of cover crop residue can protect the soil and improve agronomic conditions for plants. You also want it because, remember, it's, it's operating as a um, sponge sitting on top there. So now I don't have runoff, so that's that leaky system part. I'm armoring up. The other thing is it's keeping things cooler. Now I know there's one orchardist in here. That mulch is really important for trees. So for anybody who's trying to establish trees, you need that mulch to keep the roots cool. The other thing about the cool soils, everybody goes, oh, but it's so bad I can't get my crop up and it's bad like this. The thing about that cover is that later on when it's hot, and this isn't really hot I realize, but when it's hotter, the thing about it is, is that it keeps the roots cool. What happens with the roots keep staying cool is it allows the plant to keep the stream of water coming from the soil up into the chute, transpiration stream. That keeps the upper plants cool. What else does it do? If you're a seed grower, what's really important is you have to have high quality seed that we all need. You have to have enough nutrients in it to have a high quality seed. If I maintain transpiration, that means that I maintain the nutrients like calcium and boron. Boron, soybeans, it keeps them coming up. And it keeps it in there because otherwise I can't keep making pods and I can't keep the flowers on if I don't have the boron. And I can't have the boron if I'm not maintaining a transpiration stream into the plant. So that's the other thing that comes around here. And what does that depend on again? Comes back to soil structure, comes back to water stable aggregates, comes back to water holding capacity. And that's what allows us to maintain, to increase and maintain yields. If we can hold the flowers on their plants, we can make the pods, then we're doing a great job. After hearing from Dr. Clapperton, we walked through a diverse cover crop mix field to another soil pit to hear how Chris uses cover crops to restore degraded soil. Um, what I've done on another farm, uh, it had about three, four acre outcropping out of 160 acres of some Adair soils. The Adair soil is where the glacier scraped away, didn't deposit any you know, good stuff. It left a few rocks out there. Well, anyway, on that farm, it was a rented farm, and we'd always farm right through that. The soybeans on that area would only get, you know, uh, and it was just, we're losing money on that three or four acres, but you just go ahead and farm right through it because it's right in the middle of the field. So uh, the soil next to it has a CSR rating of 71, 72. The Adair has a CSR rating of 15. So yeah, we and it was about like stuff like this is what we're trying to do. So what I did is like, why are we doing this? This is insanity of doing that. You know, I could leave that alone. We could seed it down CRP, but it's like we want to get it back into productivity. So what I did, I did a multi-species mix. We did about 70% oats, forage oats, spring oats, um, and then about 20-30% uh, barley, spring barley. 
Then we had buckwheat, we had flax, some mustards. We did about a 15-way mix because we're trying to emulate our prairie soils. That's what all these soils were. And they had many different species of plants and different roots going into the ground. So what we're trying to do is emulate the prairie. We planted that and we left that grow to maturity. So the first part of, or into July, we just went out there bat wing shred that. So now we've got, we seeded that with the, the air seeder in there, um, in that vertical tillage. Um, I even hate what it does, the disturbance. I really want to put straight blades on that. When I use that to air seed, it's blowing the seed on top. And when it's going through doing the, the cross cutting in there, we are just barely letting that go in the ground. We will not sink that deep in the ground. We just want a little fracture line. I kind of call it like when the buffalo roamed across, how they made the seeding, that heavy weight of that buffalo hoof doing a shearing action creates a little place for that seed to anchor in. And that's what I'm kind of emulate. You know, that's what I've had for years instead of updating equipment. That works great. Uh, when we do cover crops, uh, you know, chasing the combine, I, I have a lot of different hired help that come to help in the fall. I could put anybody on that. It doesn't plug, you know, as long as they paint the screen and uh, keep the seed level from running out, it works. And, and so that's how I seeded that mix in the spring. And as soon as we could, just like in oat seeding time, we put that multi-species mix out, left it grow uh, mid-July, mid-later July when the oats were all mature and some of the other things, the, the mustards were seeded out, uh, the turnips were seeding, the buckwheat had shot some seed. We went and shredded that down so we've got all that biomass mulch. We're not taking anything off this farm, uh, off that three, four acres. And like I say, I'm paying cash rent on those three, four acres besides the other, but it's like I'm leaving this alone. Then we have 30 to 40 bushel of oats. And so it was just a thick carpet. By the end of the season, we had fungal threads going all over. The earthworms came back. So then when we went back to row cropping the next year, we did a soil test on it. The soil test only showed an organic matter change of like 0.1%. So the nutrient analysis didn't really change. So on the standard soil test, it was showing no difference between what we'd done and the soil that's good right next to it. So, or I mean the soil from the year before and then after the cover crop, the soil test, the basic soil test, the NP and K, it did not change. The organic matter, like I say, changed just a, a slight bit. But when we had the row crop in there, you could not tell the difference of the soybeans from that 15 CSR to the 70 CSR. You know, it, it more than doubled the yield. So that year of rest, and then um, we're wondering how long that effect, and I'm hoping that effect will last like five, six years before we'd have to repeat that. And then the next year, we went to the south 160 of that farm, did the same thing. You know, and, and we could see some changes like this. But when you, have, when you shred that down and let that go to seed, you're putting you know, 30, 40 bushel of oats per acre that you grew there. So let's put it out there and really re regenerate that soil. So it's a way we can take some of these spots of our soil. You know, we could even put some pollinators in there so during that time, we can bring in the beneficials. And so... That's what we're doing here, but if you really get down here and look, you know, we start to, you know, see this change in a very, very short time. So we, we can regenerate the soil, but it takes a little time, but it, all it takes is plants and all these, you know, combinations of the plant roots. Why are cover crops and restoring the soil so important to Chris? To him, it's all about leaving it better and not worse for the next generation. When I go to... Uh, Des Moines on Interstate 80, south side exit, uh, to exit uh, like 84, 85. Uh, the theme of the rest stop there is the Wallace Foundation. It shows all the different conservation practices we've done, you know, strip till, grass waterways, terraces, no-till farming. You know, those are all kind of inside and posted up. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, we're doing some of these things right. But then outside is a very confusing message. There are soil columns 
about 18 inch diameter made out of concrete and the very top has a black band that shows the depth of topsoil. The very first one is the year 1850. It shows we had 14 and a half inches of topsoil. And that's documented. That's what, on average, the upper Midwest, that's what we had after the, when the prairies were being broke out. We had 14 and a half inches of topsoil. Then it goes through a series of years. Then it goes down. The last column is the year 2000. We're down to five inches of topsoil on the average. You know, looking around, there's some farms that are down to the bee horizon. You see those clay knobs. You know, it's like, is that the legacy that we're leaving? It's like, if we extrapolate this on out another 40, 50 years, guess what? We've started to use up all that carbon. Now we're all down to here. So it's like, hey, Chelsea, you know, here, you know, another 40, 50 years, guess what you have? You know that clay knob we used to have? Well, the whole farm's a clay knob down, you know? So I don't want to be there. I would like to see by, you know, like the year 2025, more adoption of this and really understanding how to regenerate our soil that we start put another column up there that shows an increase. So how do we get there? What are the first steps? Chris thinks that having young farmers custom seed cover crops might be one answer. You know, give some opportunities for a young guy if he wanted to get into business and more people would come together and put together a, a, a larger no-till drill and have a younger person go around and chase the harvest, you know, because that's what I hear the most complaint. I don't have the time to do it. To learn more about Chris Teachout, check out our interview with him on our podcast, On Farm. You can find that at practicalfarmers.org slash podcasts or on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. 